Welcome to Sideline Sports Podcast. If you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. What a year it is to be an L.A. fan. Both the Lakers and the Dodgers winning their championships. I'm the host of Sideline Sports Podcast, Alex Naveka. Or if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. And with me today is the man himself. He said it on the one-year anniversary that he would come back when the Dodgers won the World Series. I never forgot it ever since he said it. But none other than Jorge Jarin himself. Jorge, how are you doing right now? Oh, look uh, at you- this, Alex. How could I not be doing better than this? Look at this. <laughs> Blue heaven. Dodgers clinching it. Game six. And I've got a little preview for you right here, buddy. What do you think <laughs> this is? All right. This is a replica of the 1988 World Series championship trophy. Back then when the O'Malley's owned the Dodgers, this is something that they gave out to all their players and their broadcasters in addition to their rings. So you can see this is little brother and there's a new one on its way. And it's going to say 2020 world champion Los Angeles Dodgers. And it can't get any better than that. And it just lo- just sounds so good when you say it. 2020, Los Angeles Dodgers as your champions. But that's that's a nice piece of that's a nice piece of artifact. That's a nice artifact right there, Jorge. That it is. So it looks so nice, and I can't wait for you to get that 2020 champ uh, that trophy. But you know what, Jorge? I have to say, congratulations to yeah. you. And winning your first World Series championship with the Dodgers. And you, I know you tasted the championship in 2017. You can even say 2018. But finally, you could taste the carne asada on this one here, this, here in 2020. So I want to say congrats yeah. to you and the whole entire broadcasting crew. I know your dad has a couple already. But, I mean, it's got to feel good oh, for yeah. you. It's your first one. Well, yes, absolutely. You know, for my dad... It's his sixth World Series, and uh, this is my first ring, World Championship ring that I'll be getting uh, by the beginning of next season when we kick off the 2021 season. But I'll tell you, it is, uh, we've been to the World Series. I've had an opportunity to, to call the World Series uh, now for the third time in the last four years. You know, you got you to gotta really stop and think where we were. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, the Dodgers had filed for bankruptcy. Frank McCord had sold the team. Guggenheim Baseball comes along, and all of a sudden, they take over. They invest in the team. They make it their point that they're going to bring a championship to Los Angeles. And in the last eight years that Guggenheim has run the Dodgers, we have won the Western Division eight times. We have won the National League uh, pennant twice, and we have now won the World Series and it feels fantastic. I am so happy, so pleased for all of these players, considering what everything they went through in this particular year. This year was like no other. I know that it's been discussed. I know that it's been talked about ad nauseum, but it's worth repeating once again. This was a year like no other, and despite the hardships, despite the challenges, there will be no asterisk next to this championship. 60 games, yes. Everybody had to play 60 games, and everyone had to go through probably the most difficult postseason I have ever seen with the added 16 teams total. I mean, it was tough. You had to get through Milwaukee. You had to get through a very, very difficult San Diego Padre team. Then along come the Atlanta Braves, uh, just a super powerhouse team from the East Coast. And at one point, as we all know, the Dodgers were down three games to one, facing elimination and they came straight back to win three straight from Atlanta to win the National League Championship. And then here comes Tampa Bay, a team that is very similar in nature and in structure to the Los Angeles Dodgers in many ways. But the added advantage was that the Dodgers just had a deeper uh, roster of talented depth, and that was what was able to win out in the long run. And it has just been so satisfying because these guys have worked so very hard with so many obstacles and challenges along the way. And at the end, 
they're left at the top of the mountain. And they're the only team at the top of that mountain. And it, yep. this, just this World Series just hit even more because you just felt like you knew this was going to be the Dodgers' year. They went through such a huge trial with the Atlanta Braves. I think a lot of us were thinking that the Dodgers were going mm -hmm. to be out in that one when they were 3-1. Mm -hmm. But it just goes to show you, Jorge, in baseball, it's not over till it's over. It's not like football. It's not like it's not like basketball. It's not like football where time is against you. Actually, time is on your mm -hmm. side. You stay patient at the plate. If, if you're on the mound, you want to go yep. in and out of the dugout very quickly. And that's exactly what the Dodgers did. They had great at-bats against one of the – the league's top pitchers in glass now and they struggle against Blake Snell, but that's Blake Snell and the Dodgers are just fight it out on a team. That's really identical to them because the Rays didn't give up at all either, especially that comeback win. No. I believe it was game five or game four that they came back. So game four. game four, there we go. So just these two very talented teams, number one and number two in all of major league baseball, but it, hold on, if you had to choose one player that this World Series means the most to, who would you say? Oh, as far as it, what it means, it's hard to pick out because every one of those guys were focused as one unit. They came together. Um, it's interesting in talking to some of the players afterwards or listening to their comments, I should say, uh, you know, this whole COVID thing only made it so much more difficult. But at the same time, uh, believe it or not, there may have been a silver lining to it in that it really ended up creating a cohesiveness for these guys because from day one of the postseason, uh, they were together in isolation, staying at segregated hotels, uh, uh, segregated from the rest of the community in terms of just being isolated with each other. And they were with each other all the time. This reminds me of the success of the Dodgers that they used to enjoy back in the late 50s and through the 60s, uh, because back then, when they trained at Vero Beach, after they were done training for the day, they didn't go their separate ways. They didn't go to their rented condominiums or their apartments or wherever in Florida. They stayed right there at the spring training facility where housing was provided. So they were together night and day, taking their meals three times a day together, staying together in the evenings. So all of a sudden, you have the same situation in this last World Series where these guys were together all the time. And it just brought them even closer and they came together as one to uh, really uh, go after that goal of bringing home a, a championship. So uh, it, it, it's very interesting how this all came about. And by far, I think the way the Dodgers were structured, they were the team that was going to uh, have all the guns uh, to grind it out from pitching to the bullpen to uh, having a plan of attack for all the teams, they showed tremendous patience and, and, and uh, I would say strike zone recognition. You know, Max Muncy, if you look at him, he didn't have the greatest batting average, but he got on base 21 or 22 times, I believe, by way of walks. And truly, a walk is as good as a hit when you're in the World Series. And getting on base is important for when you pass the baton and the other, uh, the guy behind you is able to uh, uh, come up with a base hit or a double or even a home run and give you that opportunity to put more than just one run on the board at a time. But as to what this means, of, it, it, it means something a little different for everyone. For Dave Roberts, I think it is, uh, uh, it means so much to finally join uh, both Walter Alston and Tommy Lasorda as the only managers that have ever won a World Series with the Los Angeles Dodgers. He becomes the first African-American and Asian uh, manager to ever win the World Series wearing the uniform of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, what does this mean to Clayton Kershaw? Well, my God, we could spend a whole show just talking about Clayton Kershaw, and he finally got that monkey off his back. All the time that the, the pundits and, the, and the, uh, the, the experts had said, well, you know, Clayton Kershaw, is a fine pitcher, a Hall of Famer first ballot. But his one big knock was that he couldn't really win the big game in the World Series. Well, not only did he win one big game, he won two. 
and in the playoffs that uh, were so important in the World Series. Uh, he, he is, uh, this means more to him than anything else. It's the one thing that was missing to his resume, and he is a lock, first-time ballot into the Hall of Fame. What does this mean to Justin Turner? Justin Turner, who scratched out like anyone else, an uh, uh, unknown up until 2014, been with the, with the Mets, and the Mets gave up on him. They released him. And it was only because he happened to be at an alumni game, of all places, an alumni game for Cal State Fullerton. And at the time, Dodger coach Tim Wallach saw, you know, Justin Turner. They were talking, and Turner had just told him about how he had uh, been released by the, by the uh, Mets. And uh, it was Wallach that went back to Dodger manager and said, hey, you know, here's a guy that I think we should take a shot at, and we should invite him to spring training. We've got nothing to lose. Let's see what he can do. He certainly hadn't shown that he had improved and discovered uh, his secret to his consistent hitting in the last three months of the 2014 season with the Mets. But the Mets had already decided on their future plans and it moved on without him. So when he came to spring training, he was able to win himself a position. And look what he's done. He's been the heart and soul of this of this uh, Dodger team. Um, it means something different to uh, a Corey Seager, who came up as as the top prospect for the Los Angeles Dodgers when he arrived, but injuries plagued him. Uh, he had a problem with his hip. He had to have surgery for that. Then all of a sudden, Tommy John surgery. My God, what else can go wrong? But yet he persevered. He got healthy, and he showed that he could contribute. And not only could he contribute, but contribute in a very big way. Corey Seager grew like no other player in this season. He became so focused. He matured into the kind of player that he has shown that he can is and will be. Corey Seager is a superstar in the making. And then, of course, you've got Cody Bellinger with the pressure of someone who has won in uh, last year the National League MVP. With that comes the pressure of having to perform. And it's been tough for him because this COVID gave him a lot of downtime. And what happens in the downtime? Some of these guys, they start tinkering. They start trying to improve something that is already working. And he ended up losing his groove for a while in his batting, but he found it at the most important time. And that is in the playoffs and in the World Series in particular. Now, you got another guy. What does this mean to Mookie Betts? Mookie Betts, who had already won a world championship with the Boston Red Sox in 2018 to defeat this very team. But Mookie had already made the decision that he was going to test out free agency. He, he had no interest in returning to the Boston Red Sox. And, the, and with that trade, it gave the Dodgers the opportunity to demonstrate to him what kind of an organization it is. When he came to spring training, as is the case in many uh, with many other players, I have heard this time and time again. It's one thing to be a major league baseball player, but certain organizations have the ability, have the knowledge, have the smarts, and have the right people to help you take your game to the next level. And Mookie Betts was so impressed, I believe, with what he saw from the spring training facility to the type of uh, coaching staff and instructors and trainers that work with them, from the analytics, all of, that he said, when they made him that offer because he knew that they wanted him to stay, he decided this is where I need to stay. So this World Series means something different and personal to each and every player. Max Muncy to Austin Barnes in his sixth season now. Uh, you know, he had bounced back and forth between being a starter, then losing his position, not even being in the playoff roster at the first part last year to making a, a, a great comeback and coming up big. I mean, we can go down the roster one by one by one, and I'm telling you, there is a specific individual story for each and every one that makes this triumph so, so special to them for their own spe uh, specific reasons. It's just been, it's been quite a ride. And, it's, and, and, and at the same time, I'll tell you, I'm, and I know I'm just rambling on, I should be letting you ask your questions and everything, but, you know, the feeling is that um, I, it was very hard on so many people because we could not be together. Uh, we could not travel with the team. 
Uh, we knew what this team meant and, and what they had constructed and what they were capable of doing. And yet we couldn't be there to be down on the field, to talk to them before the game, to see how they're feeling, to look into their eyes, to watch their body language, to hear the commentary back and forth between all the other players, the banter around the batting cage, which we're so used to doing, riding on the bus, being in the hotel with them, seeing them in the lobby, talking at breakfast uh, when you're when you're taking a meal and, and, and seeing them. Being isolated with, like that was such a challenge. And I have to tell you that we were so elated to see them win. But for many of us, from Lana Rizzo to Oral Hershiser to myself, we all felt like this is, uh, this is uh, so wonderful. And at the same time, you felt a little empty the following day because you couldn't be there with them. I remember the celebrations that we had in Milwaukee and in Chicago when we won on the road. Those champagne celebrations in the clubhouse, getting drenched in beer, being hugged, and, and, and everyone being so happy and so relieved. And then going back to the hotel and having a, a private reception with just the players and the broadcasters and the coaching staff. And we missed all of that. But you know what? I give it up all gladly for the end result. And that is that Los Angeles, once again, after 32 years, as much as we love 1988, we're not going to have to only refer to the Kirk Gibson home run as that great moment in Dodger history. It's not just that anymore. We have so many highlights and future uh, uh, series winners on the horizon with this team. Absolutely, Jorge. There, you brought up so many good points that I don't really think anybody really thought about. I think everybody just thought of, oh, Kershaw, this means the world to Kershaw. But when you brought it up, it just meant like there's so many players that it means a lot to. I mean, you even add the two um, Chicanos, you add, um, oh, you add man. Uh, Julio Rias also, and then you add uh, Victor Gonzalez. Victor Gonzalez. These, you know, we, let's talk a little bit for a moment about the, the Dodgers and the, Lat and the Latino community. I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to be a part of an effort that started all the way back in 1958 when Walter O'Malley, who truly was a visionary, when he came to Los Angeles, he couldn't help but notice the influence of the Latino culture from architecture to the food in the area, to restaurants, to the language, hearing so much Spanish being spoken in and around Southern California, that it, it became apparent to him, um, that, you know, they had broken the color barrier with Jackie Robinson uh, 20 plus years earlier in New York, but now he's in Los Angeles, first team to move west of the Mississippi and to do so, they had to convince the San Francisco Giants to make that move as well so that Major League Baseball would say, OK, we're not going to do this just for one team. But if we have two teams on the West Coast and, of course, they want to uh, uh, they wanted to increase the footprint of Major League Baseball across the country. I mean, these were new markets and the Dodgers recognized the value of the Latino. But more than that, when Fernando Mania struck, that really took it to a new level when you had Fernando Valenzuela, who came out of nowhere, just like some of these guys that you've seen today who are now heroes, Julio Rias and Victor Gonzalez. No one knew of them earlier. Julio Rias was signed as a 16-year-old kid when Mike Brito, scout for the Dodgers, went to look for Yasiel, went to look at Yasiel Puig in a showcase in Mexico. And I remember Mike Brito coming back to me um, at Dodger Stadium, sitting down at dinner prior to a game in the press box in the dining room there. And he's telling us about, I've just seen this, as he said, he visto un chamaco que no lo van a creer. Este puede ser otro Fernando. Another young kid could be another Fernando with his impact. He's something else, he said. But he was only 16 at the time. And they signed him, and they were able to develop him along the way. And then, of course, now we end up with Julio Rias on the mound to finish the game as the, as, as, as the guy who saved the, got the save with Victor Gonzalez pitching an outstanding uh, inning of relief to, re to qualify as the winner. So now you have, once again, a reflection of the value of the Latino community. The Latino community has been the most loyal fan base in baseball to the Los Angeles Dodgers. Back in those times when the team was 
uh, in, in the midst of a bankruptcy with uh, Frank McCourt was going through all the trials and the, and, 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 and the challenges that he was with his personal life affecting his business life, the divorce that uh, ultimately took them to uh, drastic measures of filing for bankruptcy to protect himself so that Major League Baseball wouldn't take the team away from him. Uh, he held on in order to be able to do the right thing, which was to sell the team. And he did a marvelous job in terms of, of selling it to the right people. And the right people came along in, the, in, in terms of Guggenheim with Magic Johnson and Mark Walters, Stan Kast and, 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 uh, and others that, that uh, continued that tradition. They recognized that when Stan Kast in first run, he told me, he said, Jorge, go in my office because he wasn't there. We're, he said, go to my office. I want you to go to my office right now. Tell Cheryl, my assistant, to let you in. And I want you to go in and look at the wall behind my desk. And there on the wall behind his desk were photographs of Jackie Robinson, Tommy Lasorda, and my father, Jaime Harim, and Sandy wow. Koufax, and just the, the, the six most important Vin Scully, my father, Sandy Koufax, Tommy Lasorda, Walter Alston, and Jackie Robinson. And he's got those all framed. He goes, you know, that's part of the legacy of this team. This is the legacy that we were aware of when we wanted to buy this, when we put this ownership group together. And we're so happy to continue that. And we're the only, um, well, we were the first, let's put it that way. We're the first to... Uh, dedicate a Spanish language broadcast all 162 games uh, plus uh, uh, selected games in the spring and all of the postseason whenever the Dodgers were in the postseason. So they made a commitment to the Latino community and it's been more than just language. It's a it's it's having a cultural understanding of what it means to be Latino and to be a Dodger fan because time and time again people have come to me and said I've listened to your father for as long as I can remember. Or I grew up and it was your father's voice in the background when my mom was cooking and the Dodger game was on and she was in the kitchen. Or my dad would come home from work and he'd turn on the radio and we'd go out and play catch in the backyard until it got dark, it was time to eat, and then we'd listen to the game. Because remember, back then, the games came on later. At, there were times when the games came on at 8.05 in the evening and it would last until 11 o'clock at night. And my father always said, hey, Jorge, remember, what we're doing is a public service. We're giving people who are hardworking, who are many times working two jobs to make ends meet, who come home tired after a long day. And they love this team because their grandparents were Dodger fans. Their parents were Dodger fans. They were raised as Dodger fans. Theo and Thea, uh, aunts and uncles, cousins. Everyone was a Dodger fan. And you grew up as a Dodger fan. And, uh, you know, I'm just so happy that, you know, that the Dodgers recognize this and have never given up on it or cut back like some other teams have done who said, you know, uh, people don't listen as much on the radio anymore. So we're we're cutting back. We're going to just do selected games or home games or whatever. And then there's some teams that have come along lately, like the St. Louis Cardinals, who in the last two years finally decided, hey, it's time to do a Spanish language broadcast. And they look at the Dodgers as the template, as the example. How can we make our broadcast be as good as theirs? And we're very proud of that. We're just so proud because it has taken on a, a ripple effect so that it's affected other teams as well to do the same thing. It's the right thing to do. Right, and LA is such a such a diverse city where you, if you want your English, you can get your English, but you have to expect a high volume of Latinos to tune into mm -hmm. the Spanish mm -hmm. broadcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little something I haven't told you, Jorge, is I don't listen to English broadcasts anymore. I do everything in Spanish now. I listen to both football, basketball, and baseball, everything in Spanish now. And well, you know what? Yeah, my dad was the one that listened to Jaime Jarrin, but when I hop into the car, I listen to Jorge Jarrin, so uh, <laughs> I just want, to, just want to tip my cap to the uh, Spanish broadcast you. team. Uh, all of you guys, Pepe Iniguez, Fernando Valenzuela, Jorge Jarrin, uh, Jesus Quinones, and also, of course, the Hall of Fame broadcaster himself, and all you guys will be as well. Jaime Jarrin, just tipping my cap to you guys, and I listen to you guys every time I hop straight into the car. It's time for the Dodger game. I, no radio. Yes. Nothing. 
it's Dodgers baseball and Espanol. There's, and I, Espanol. I, it's got to be like that. It has to. Well, you know, the thing is, when we're talking about uh, our Latino fan base, we really have to look at two markets within one. There's the, there is the cultural side aspect of it where you can consume this in Spanish. For those of you who want to uh, either uh, improve your Spanish or you want to maintain your Spanish or just feel more comfortable listening to it in Spanish, it's there for you. But what I love about it as well is the fact that there are many Latino fans who do listen in English, and that's fine because at the end of the day, it gives them something to talk about to their tío, to their abuelita, to their prima, to whatever, who may be listening to it in Spanish, but you listen to it in English. But you know what? At the end of the day, you're talking about the same thing, the same things, the same highlights, the same uh, ecstasy of of winning as well as the disappointments when the defeats do happen. It, it, it is, uh, it is uh, the game itself, the team itself is the common denominator and can be consumed in both languages. And I think that's only, uh, it's only right. And, you know, the thing is, ever since we started uh, uh, being carried on the internet, uh, Major League Baseball providing it, we have people who are listening to us in foreign countries that never had an opportunity. We had a, a, a young man who called into the pregame show the other day from El Salvador. He said, you know, before when I was uh, much younger and listening to the Dodger games, we'd only get it when it was in the, when it came to the, to the playoffs, to the World Series, the National League Championship. We only got that because it was special programming that was made available. We didn't get the whole season. Now, I can follow the whole season from beginning to end. And I tell people, don't, you know, when things aren't going right, I said, don't get down. Don't get down because you know what? You can't enjoy the highs if you haven't been way down in the valley. You can't enjoy, enjoy the view from the mountaintop if you haven't been standing down in the valley looking up. In other words, the whole season is made up. Each game to me is a different chapter in one big story that starts on the first day of spring training. And in our case, it ends with the winning of the World Series. It's a big story. So enjoy the ride all the way through. You win as a team, you lose as a team, but you win championships together. Absolutely. There was not one player that didn't do a thing in this World Series. Everybody played their parts. Everybody had a responsibility mm -hmm. during this World Series. But one thing we do need to talk about, Jorge, is sure. hey, World Series is done. There's a to-do list. Now you got to start planning for 2021. What do you think is on that Dodgers to-do list? Well, let me, let, me, uh, let me do a quick reference here. I'll look this up because I do carry it with me. I'm, you know, I have uh, the breakdown of who's, who remains, who's a free agent. So let me go through that. I'll find it in one second, and I'll give it to you. Let's see. Here we go. Players that are still under contract for this coming year. Of course, we've got Mookie Betts. Kenley Jansen, Joe Kelly, Clayton Kershaw, Max Muncy, A.J. Pollock, David Price, Chris Taylor. Those guys are still under contract. S players who are now uh, free agents are Pedro Baez, Kike Hernandez, Jock Peterson, Blake Trinan, Justin Turner, Alex Wood. Those players will be free agents. Those who are arbitration, I believe, eligible for arbitration, who will still be with the team, Scott Alexander, Austin Barnes, Cody Bellinger, Walker Bueller, Dylan Floro, Adam Kolarik, Corey Seager, and Julio Urias. So those players all are eligible for arbitration, which means they're staying, and the team has the option to uh, give them an offer uh, to improve their salary structure, the team, the, the player has the opportunity through his agents to counter and they can decide, uh, an impartial judge will decide which of the two figures that have been submitted will be their salary for the coming year. So those are the players who are still under contract. But again, let's go back to just the free agents. Let's talk about that. And that is Pedro Baez, Kike Hernandez, Jock Peterson, Blake Trinan, Justin Turner, and Alex Wood. Um, Justin Turner is uh, finished this year making $16 million. Uh, I, he's 36 years old. So, uh, I, I personally can't see Justin Turner going somewhere else. Uh, he could be a designated hitter. 
uh, as he uh, begins to wind down a little bit his his level. But I mean, did you see him in, in, in playing third base? He still has that ability. He still plays defensively. He's as good. I would put him still in the top five of the uh, uh, third baseman in the National League. Um, up there, along with uh, Nolan Arenado, along with Manny Machado, uh, I, and, and I know I'm missing a couple of others that aren't coming to my mind right now, but he's right in there. He, you, you're not losing that much defensively, but the fact of the matter is he is 36 years old. He, he's probably looking for maybe one or two more years, I would assume. So I hope the Dodgers bring him back. He's the heart and soul. And of course, putting aside for a moment this whole thing that happened during the final game with him and the COVID, I mean, that's unfortunate because Justin Turner is one of the least selfish people that I have ever met. Uh, he is uh, generous with his time, his efforts. He, he cares deeply about the homeless, about veterans. He has a, an outstanding foundation that is very active, but it doesn't excuse what happened. Uh, I think he just got caught up in the moment. It's unfortunate. Uh, we have to be careful that it doesn't become the, 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 the final story of the World Series because there's so much to that. And I hope that people will come to understand and forgive him because it's so important where we are in this country at this time that we do maintain the health protocols that have given, been given to us by our health officials. I think it's more important to get away from the, uh, the politicalization of this COVID thing. And unfortunately, that was not something that looked good. And I know that uh, in his heart, Justin Turner, I'm sure regrets the fact that this happened and how it happened. But uh, I think the Dodgers should bring him back. I certainly hope that Blake Trinan will be uh, also uh, brought back. Uh, I think that Kike Hernandez with his ability to play so many different positions from, and he's an outstanding second baseman. He's also an outstanding backup shortstop, and he can give you that ability at left field, right field. He can play the outfield. He, he's got a, a, a left-handers. He feasts off the left-handers. He has power. He has that ability, and I think that Kike Hernandez is only going to get better. So I would love to see Kike Hernandez return. Pedro Baez is also another important part of the bullpen. Uh, Pedro's had his ups downs but I think with the confidence and what he's been able to do and he's still becoming the type of uh, I don't think we've seen the very best of Pedro Baez just yet I think he has the stuff that it takes eventually to possibly become a new closer so uh, you know we have those options you have Victor Gonzalez you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of players in the bullpen a lot of uh, uh, relief pitchers in the bullpen who've got outstanding stuff but what they need to develop and what the Dodgers need to work on is help some of these guys that have the potential, a Dustin May, uh, a Pedro Baez, a Victor Gonzalez, to uh, develop a swing and miss type of pitch. Most of our pitchers work on developing uh, soft contact and getting outs that way. But we need a, 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 we need a closer who can come in and just shut things down and strike players, you know, strike batters out. And uh, we haven't seen that in a while. Uh, Kenley, uh, you got to understand that how long has it been? It's eight years now. I mean, you can't expect that kind of performance out of Kenley Jansen to last forever. And he's evolving. And if you really do look at his numbers and compare his numbers overall, I mean, he was the re relief player of the month in the month of August. I mean, he still has that ability but it comes and it goes and you have to give credit to the, to the opposing batters that have, uh, uh, that they have uh, strategized so well uh, those, the strengths and the weaknesses and how to ex exploit the weaknesses of some of the players in the bullpens. Um, you can always have room for improvement. Uh, and I'm sure that the Dodgers are focused on that of trying to improve that bullpen. Cause to me, pitching wins championships, but when you have a, a, a lineup like the Dodgers that, grinds it out there's no easy out and of course the the designated hitter being introduced into the national league this year really made the dodgers work in the dodgers favor now the designated hitter will go away next year 
because it's the final year of the collective bargaining agreement. For that to happen and become a, a, a regular staple of the National League in the, in the style that it's played, uh, that has to come under the new collective bargaining agreement that will begin uh, negotiations this year and uh, will take effect in 2022. So in 2022, it's quite possible that we will see, uh, once again, the designated hitter in the National League. But in 2021, that won't be the case. It'll be back to pitchers hitting once again, unless something uh, is accomplished during the offseason where an agreement is made and an, an, a, an, an amendment to the existing uh, collective bargaining agreement between the uh, uh, Players Association and Major League Baseball. I think anything is possible, really, with how Rob Manfred has been running the show lately. I mean, doing the 16 teams, making mm -hmm. it to the playoffs, uh, changing that 60 game season. I think anything is possible to happen. And you know what? I do agree with some of the decisions that you made as far as some of the free agents are concerned. We got it. The mm -hmm. Dodgers have to bring back a lot of these guys because each and every one of those guys helped out significantly. And I, I think Kenley Jansen's days of closing games is over. If you ask me, you need a guy that's consistent mm -hmm. and baseball is all about that consistency. Got to be a consistent hitter. Got to be a consistent pitcher. That, that's why you're good because you're consistently good. Mm -hmm. That's why Trevor Hoffman was good. That's why Mariano Rivera was good. That, that's why those, those big names became big names because mm -hmm. they could come in in the ninth and they would just shut it out. doesn't matter what age you put on them. They were able to close down the doors. Younger Kenley Jansen was – he was elite. He had that one, two, three outing type of capacity, but no, now it's just we don't know what we're going to get out of Jansen type of thing. Well, J Jansen needs to evolve. I think that he is a, a, a great talent, a viable a uh, talent who has a lot of value, a lot of experience and a lot of value, but he needs to evolve. Maybe the closer role is no longer the case for him. Uh, but remember um, how impressive a role this Chapman is. And yet a role this Chapman in facing Tampa Bay couldn't get it done. He gave up home runs like Henley Jansen does. It is, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's constantly evolving. You have to constantly uh, a tweak. But here's the thing. You got to remember, you got to be very, very careful in that you don't want to make the same mistake that unfortunately the previous management of the San Francisco Giants did when they went on that, that, that streak where they won every other year for three years, they won the World Series. And they made a commitment to the people that got them there and, 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 and won those championships. And unfortunately, they locked them up into long-term contracts for big contracts. And after a period of time, it just became an anchor around their necks. They didn't have the flexibility to make the kind of changes to keep up. And part of that came from the loyalty and the love that they had for uh, Pablo Sandoval, for Hunter Pence, for Madison Bumgarner, for uh, Brandon Crawford. Those guys had tremendous careers that you can't take anything away from what they accomplished and they deserve every accolade that they earned. But the fact of the matter is baseball is a business and there comes a time where you have to say, I need to move on because I see the writing on the wall and I love you. Uh, I thank you. Uh, it's a business. You've been well compensated. And, uh, but it's tough when you are a major league player in the twilight of your career and you're earning 16, 17, 18, 20, $25 million a year. I mean, we all think, oh my God, to get paid that kind of money and to play baseball for a living, how wonderful is that? But you don't think about the pressure and the expectations. A $16 million a year contract for a position player, you got to produce. They're expecting and the fans are expecting. And when things don't go well, it can be very hard on you and your family. And uh, it, is, uh, it is not easy. I would not want to trade places with a lot of these guys what they go through. So I have great admiration for, for their abilities and how they're able to be consistent. Because baseball is all about he who makes learns to make the adjustment. You make the adjustments when the pitchers in during the first part of the year and the pitchers are fresh and they're on their game and they're getting you out and you got to find a way.
and you make that adjustment, you start having success, then they'll adjust on you. The, the, the opposing teams will strategize and come up with a plan on how to attack you, and then you have to make another adjustment again. It comes in waves. It's all about who can make the adjustment during the course of the season, and not just once, but three, four, five times during the course of a 162-game season. So, um, you know, the Dodgers, uh, they have the nucleus. They have the ability to sustain this for quite some time. You can call it a dynasty. Yeah, of course they want to be dominant and everything. But I'll tell you right now, the San Diego Padres are going to be breathing down their necks, and they're only going to get better. And I'm telling you, the San Francisco Giants are going to be following in that same path because Farhan Zaidi, who knows the Dodgers very well, is now the general manager. He knows the strengths and weaknesses and how to counteract. And he's going to look for players to build a similar roster. And you're already beginning to see it now. The first week of the season, people thought the Giants, what a lousy team. Terrible, terrible team. They're never going to go anywhere. They surprised an awful lot of people because they got an influx, influx of young guys. They felt they had nothing to lose, and they gave them opportunities. And that's how you find those who will rise to the top like the cream, and you can insert them in and become – and the more they play, the better they're going to get. So it's not going to be easy. This doesn't mean this doesn't guarantee us because we've won a World Series this year that this is the beginning of a dynasty. We have a dynasty to a certain degree. We've won the, the, the Western Division eight years in a row, but that's not enough. We've won the National League Championship twice now within the last four years, but that's not enough. You want to win year after year after year. But as again, I remind people, then enjoy the season. It's about the race. It's not so much the finish line, but you do want to be the winner at, when you cross the finish line. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change exactly what you said any other way. You spoke nothing but facts. That National League West is going to look stacked. They're going to be scary good with mm -hmm. um, the Dodgers, the Padres, the, the Giants too. And then who, who, who knows what can happen with the Diamondbacks or even with the Rockies. Yeah. I mean, they could, find, they could find their way inside the chase as well. So uh, it's going to be so interesting. And, of course, with Kenley Jackson's points mm – -hmm. um, Pitching in a big market place like L.A., uh, you know, us fans, uh, we will speak our minds when we're there in the ballpark. Yes. If we don't yeah. like you, we, if we don't like your performance, we will boo you. Just like Joe Kelly, when he was barely starting as a Dodger, he got booed. He had a hard time coming around, but I think now he's everyone's uh, favorite player now as a Dodger fan ever since the Astros scandal still makes me laugh. Every time, just that funny exchange. It just seems like he has a lot of heart. Yeah, <laughs> he's got the heart of a lion. He's got the heart of a champion beating in his chest. And you know what? It's not so much about what that means to the fan on the on the mound. Of course, you want to see him have success, but you don't realize what that also means to his fellow players. They know that Joe Kelly has their back. They know that they can count on him, and and that's what's also important is part of the makeup and the personality of this team. This team is going to be uh, very close for, for, some, for quite some time until it slowly starts to uh, change with new faces and new people coming in and the challenge starts all over again. But for now, you know, we have the heart and the, the soul of a lion at Dodger Stadium. And speaking of having him in the meantime, What's next for you, Jorge? What's the offseason look like for you? Well, uh, you know, normally during the offseason, you know, like to take advantage of it and do traveling. But in the way things are right now, um, we really can't do that. We have to be careful. We have to get ahead of this COVID virus. Uh, we have an election coming up. Uh, there's a vital interest. I'm so interested in what's going on there. And uh uh, I, I hope personally for a big change in Washington, D.C. in this election. Um, the other thing, too, that's uh, very important to me is uh, I, I'm a big dog lover. And recently, uh, my father and I and my brother, along with uh, Oral Hershiser and Ross Stripling, and a, and, and a great guy who's at the, the, the heart of this, a guy by the name of Joey Herrick, we recently uh, invested in a dog food line called Lucy Pet Foods, hmm. and we recently purchased a plant uh, where we will be um, producing 
not only this, but Breeders' Choice, uh, Avoderm, a lot of name brands that we, we, the plant producers, we acquired that in this partnership. And uh, I'm in the dog food business now. And uh, wow. that is something that I'm very, very excited about. It's called Lucy Pet Foods, and it is probably the most healthy dog food that you can give your your loving pet. Um, it's heart healthy. It's a, it's a prebiotic, high in fiber, so it's good for digestion. It's a, it, it's it's a very, very healthy food. What happened is, and I'll tell you real quickly, my my partner Joey Herrick. It was a man who created a very well-known, very successful uh, brand of dog food called Natural Balance, along with Dick Van Patten. And uh, Joey made that, uh, took it to this level, and then he sold it to a much, much larger company. And then he signed uh, an agreement not to compete in the dog food business for seven years. Well, he's into rescuing animals. He started a foundation. We have a foundation because spaying and neutering is so important. Uh, for the dog population. We're trying to get to a point where in California we're eliminating uh, kill shelters where if a pet is abandoned and is taken to a shelter, he's there for a short period of time, anywhere from uh, 10 days to a month or so. And if nobody wants to adopt him, they're euthanized. And it's awful. It really is. And we're trying to get to that. So uh, to the point where we don't have to do that anymore, we have to control the population of, of dogs and cats in, 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 in the country. And in California specifically, we know that uh, getting your dog or cat spayed or neutered is expensive. I mean, not every family can afford that. And so we have a foundation, the Lucy Pet Foundation, and we have provided 28,000 free spayed and neutering uh, uh, operations to dogs uh, in, in, since we started the foundation. Uh, we support it with the, uh, the uh, proceeds from the dog food and the cat food. We provide, uh, we, 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 we uh, make the food that is used by the LAPD canine units uh, for the uh, military services. It's called tactical fuel. We've developed a recipe that is uh, for dogs that are uh, under high stressful situations uh, to maintain their, their, their health. Uh, so we've gotten rave reviews from from both the military and from law enforcement on on the caliber of the food that we make for their animals and the specific type of work that they do. But for your pet, if you want to give, make sure that, and, and I'm not joking, you want healthy poops from your dog. You know, if there's something not if they're if they're not right, if they're shedding, if they've got skin irritations and everything. Uh, you need to look into their diet. Most most uh, veterinarians will tell you that a lot of the problems that dogs and cat have could start with, with what kind of diet they are on. So we are uh, making an effort to provide the best nutrition for dogs and cats, and it's available on lucypetfoods.com direct, or you can go to Amazon or Chewy.com uh, to, to purchase this. And uh, um, I, I'm just really happy to be in that part of the business. So that's something that is also important to us, and it's a it's a year-round business for us as well as what we do with the Dodgers. Well, Jorge, I have to say congratulations to, again, we were talking about you winning your first World Series ring, but also Thank with you. creating this uh, foundation, creating this new brand for you and your dad and your brother and with Oral Hershiser. Again, congratulations to all of these great accomplishments in your life. I wish you nothing but the best in all of your endeavors. I will and, go. What's that? And Alex, if, if I may, before we wrap up, there's one other thing I, I, I want to mention real quickly while I've got you here, because I know that your podcast is growing and there's and, and, and for people like yourself who have a, a real interest, whether it be in media or in law or any kind of education, you know, last year we started a foundation on in, in honor of my mom when she passed away, the Hyman Blanca Harin Foundation. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we, we've been limited on the type of fundraising that we can do and the amount of money that we have been able to raise. However, uh, this past year, I was very proud that we were able to partner up with the LA Regional Food Bank and provide 268,000 meals to people who have been impacted by the loss of work and unemployment. But in addition to that, we have recently, just this last week, we opened up 
the application process for scholarships. So we're ready to give out our first round of scholarships for students who are trying to make ends meet to further their education and specifically to Latino students. There's a focus there. So if you are enrolled in a junior college or a Cal State college or a UC University or whatever, if you go to the Jaime and Blanca Harin Foundation.org, you will find the link to apply for a scholarship and we will be giving out scholarships for the spring. Uh, we're starting out with thirty thousand dollars. We're uh, uh, you know we're giving out four five thousand dollars scholarships and five two thousand dollars scholarships. It's not a whole lot as of yet, but we are trying to gain some traction so that we can get more money, raise more money to distribute amongst deserving students who are trying to better their lives and realize their goals. So uh, I just, uh, if you want to apply for a scholarship from our foundation, go to the Jaime and Blanca Harin foundation.org. You'll find it there. You'll find the link for the application process. You know what, Jorge, I'll make sure to put all that information down in the description below. So that way you guys can go ahead and check Great. out the foundation, go ahead and check out all of his uh, dog food products and everything that Jorge has going on. He's achieving great things. You know what? World Series champion right here. And now he's yeah. getting into the dog food business. And now he's willing to help out the, the young students that are out there. But you know what, Jorge? It was just, just thank you so much for coming back onto the podcast. I know you said you were going to come on for the World Series. And look at here we are again. Another here meeting. Here we are. <laughs> Here we are. Once again, guys, here we go. I just hold it up one more time before I let you go. World Series champion. <laughs> How does that look? Blue That's heaven nice. on earth, and it's right here in Los Angeles. Love you guys. Thank you so much for all your loyal uh, following of the Dodgers. Alex, I wish you the best on your podcast. You are a young talent that's developing. I know you've got a very bright future ahead of you, and I'm happy if I can be of any service and help you along the way. So thank you so much for inviting me to be on your podcast. For me, it's a real honor. Well, once again, Jorge, yeah, just thank you for the time. Thank you for all of the insight. And you know what? A well-broadcasted year with you and your dad, with Jesus, with the TV crew, with, with uh, Pepe Iniguez and Fernando Valenzuela. Wish you the best of luck in this offseason. Hope you enjoy it the best that you can. And, of course, if you guys like this episode of Sideline Sports Podcast, please give this episode a thumbs up. Also, hit the subscribe button down below. This is where we can get big guests, just like Jorge here. And, of course, I'm Alex Naveka, the host of Sideline Sports Podcast, signing off where if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. Have a good night, everybody. And, of course, happy Halloween. <laughs>